Hi there, this is James O'Hagan. I'm the co-programming chair at the MIT Enterprise Forum. Thank you for joining us this evening. We've gathered a group of cross-sector executives to discuss a roadmap for the Biden administration's momentous steps towards wide-scale electrification and decarbonization of the transportation sector. Before we get started, I want to tell you a bit about MIT Enterprise Forum. We're a nonprofit with a focus on supporting the tech and entrepreneurship community, and we have chapters around the world. We regularly organize workshops, expert panels, and fireside chats, and annual membership passes available for those who are interested in attending multiple events. You can learn more about our events and our membership pass at, M at, at our website, mitefmyc.org. Without further ado, let me introduce Kristen Slonina, our moderator for the evening. Well, hello everyone. I hope you had a great Wednesday, Cinco de Mayo day. So uh, my margarita will have to wait till after our, after our session here. Really excited to be with such an esteemed panel, really looking forward to a discussion that is so topical today, you know, electrification. And, uh, and what was so especially near and dear to my heart is that this May, this month was the 30th anniversary of when I did the MIT solar car team and race five days from New York um, Albany, New York to Plymouth, Massachusetts. So it's really fascinating to see how much the world has changed and how fast it is changing today. So uh, very happy to be here and I thank all the panelists. They're gonna each be giving their own introduction. And I'm gonna start off by sort of going through what I call a general state of the industry and then talking a little bit about what I'm working on today. So really excited to share that with you. All right, oops, there we go. You know, so when I was uh, putting this together, I kind of couldn't help but remember and think back to when I was a kid. And I'm sure that some of you know the Jetsons and others of you don't, but uh, you know, I remember as a kid wondering, what is, what is gonna be, is this gonna be reality when I'm grown up? And I had no idea. Um, and, and I think that's still in play, but we are certainly making progress towards that. So what really is our future looking like? And how do automotive companies working with suppliers and new technology, lots of startups are, are entering this space. And how do they work with cities to really create this whole new way that goods and people will move in the future? So I like to think back to that a little bit. And you know, these trends, not only are there major societal trends, you know, we're seeing urbanization, there's lots of environmental concerns, really just changing consumer behavior. And, you know, I have three sons of my own. They have a very different headset about driving than um, I did when I was their age. So they're sort of a good lit litmus test for me. So you take those societal trends and you couple it with the technologies that are in play. You know, there are so many of them out there right now in terms of the advancements being made. It's just so fast, you know, AI and virtual reality. There's, you know, changes and improvements in battery technology and fuel cell technology. All the talk about autonomous and blockchain electrification. So when you couple those together, what it's doing is it's giving us the opportunity for creating new experiences and new business models. You know, how do we work on this seamless, connected, on-demand, and individualized? And I look at it as it's about more efficient utilization of our assets for the future. You know, instead of having my car sit and use 95% of the time in my garage, how can we be more efficient with our assets as a whole society? So I, I'm really excited by where I see things going. And, you know, I, I consider these like the three pillars. You know, there's the autonomous, connected, and electric. And there's a lot of different stats and facts on this. Huge investment in these spaces by companies, other companies buying other companies. And, you know, we're seeing, as I said, just big dollar values. And that tipping point of the battery cost, you know, how are we going to get mass penetration? How are we going to still address some of the issues that exist today with regards to the charging time, the charging infrastructure, and just helping you know, with cons the consumer with these choices in this whole autonomous, connected, and electric space. And I like to look at this, um, I, you know, there's a characterization of mobility 1.0 up to 3.0. And really today, in my mind, we're at, at the 1.0. 
And, you know, kind of having that roadmap of where are we headed can help make strategic decisions today in terms of different companies and what they're going to do. So I, I really see Mobility 3.0 in terms of, you know, looking at the vehicle more as a platform. How do we leverage all of this great technology fully integrated so that we have, let's say, fractional ownership models, on-demand autonomous transportation, and you know, distributed ledger, smart contract integration to make everything seamless. You don't need that back office to calculate you know, who owes what when. When you look at these more complicated ecosystems of asset pools and users in these asset pools, insurance per mile, and I think we're really going to get a different headset of looking at transportation as a cost per mile basis in the future. And how can we offer very inexpensive, low cost solutions for the poor part of the population that, you know, so if someone wants to get um, an electric vertical takeoff and landing and bypass New York City traffic and get there faster and pay a premium for it, I think that's a great balance. You know, having a, an operator system where the needs of the unserved um, can be balanced by meeting the needs of the people who have more money. And, and how do we make that work as a society? Because it really is about accessibility for everybody. You know, that's gonna improve the standard of living, better accessibility to jobs and healthcare. It's just a win-win situation. And we can't just think of this myopically, right? You know, I grew up in automotive and spent, you know, 23 years in the OEM world, but it's really every single sector. And when I spent some time at Ernst & Young on their mobility initiative, I talked to all of the different sectors and everyone's asking, what are the implications and effects of the differences in transportation and these new technologies having on my company? And so we're gonna get into some, I think, really good discussions today with the panel on that. And global cities, we have, are seeing, they're having their own agendas. And, you know, I think we're going we're gonna to kind of dive into this a little bit in the, in the session as well about the role policies can play potentially to change behavior. Um, are they effective or not? So we'll, we'll have some of that dialogue as we go further into this. And I'd like to share a little bit because I've just joined the parkmyfleet.com as the chief innovation officer and working on a really cool initiative, Charge Across America, which I'll get into in a little, a little bit. And, you know, it's really all about servicing and creating these new kind of mobility hubs, right? So there's really like three challenges, right? Land, availability, and cost. You know, how, are, how, can, these, how can this grow quickly and efficiently? And also the flexibility for that growth when you know, really the current infrastructure is, is still coming to fruition and that really is a big concern. And then the integrations, right? And how do we, you know, currently there's tasks that, that require manual communication. So how do we leverage that technology to make it a lot more seamless and, and just have really a different headset about how we address and look at mobility. And what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna show a short little video here and um, this is really a rendering of the future of, you know, what these mobility hubs look like. So you can have this part of the gated part is for, you know, basically the companies, the fleet owner operators that are more private. And then you have separate that, you know, the part for the public that's very humanized and, and nice, very well lit. You know, we have, you know, Wi-Fi connections. There's places to wash the vehicles and the trucks. There's top of the line charging stations. There's on-site actual energy generation. You know, there's solar panels there with, with battery storage to actually, you know, help fill in and create the, their own energy. So it's a really, you know, the whole point is how can you think of things that are more modular that can be expanded more rapidly and help in all the elements of the future of mobility. So not only fleets, but micro mobility, when you're talking about like drones and scooters and bikes, and also that on demand transportation that, um, that is really coming into fruition, right? So, this is sort of a summary of this, you know, and that's what I'm really excited about is being a part of creating that future, creating that infrastructure and those needs to help with this multimodal, seamless, electric, autonomous future 
that uh, that is really going to change the way we move and make things a lot more efficient. And let me tell you a little bit more about the charge across America. So this is all about having electric cars race from New York all the way to LA. And I see so many parallels with what I mentioned earlier about uh, the MIT solar car race that I did uh, 30 years ago. And you know, with all the things that have happened with COVID and politics, I, I look at this as also an opportunity to unify America with positive messages, a positive view of what's possible and have technology highlights of what's coming in the future because the future shouldn't be feared. And how do we generate excitement about this future that's coming into play? So I wanna highlight you know, the, the latest in solar and drones and electric vertical takeoff and landing, autonomous vehicles, LIDAR, you know, some of those core technologies. And really it's about demystifying how we'll move because so many people I know are not sure, well, how do I, I'm afraid to take my electric car more than just you know, my 30 mile range and just use it for my local, um, you know, going to the grocery store. You know, taking it across country seems like a very ominous task. So how do we make it easier for people, show them the art of the possible as we really go through this race? So um, as I said, first of its ever 10 days. So July 10th, we're kicking off in New York and uh, we're gonna, have a, a great exciting route across the US with professional filming crews. And really it's, it's showing the art of the possible of today and also that highlight into the future of where we're headed. So really excited about that. So just my basic contact information, I uh, would love to talk to any of you that are interested in learning more about those two. So with that, I am going to hand it over to Jan to give his introduction and then he can hand it off to the next speaker. Thank you, Jan. You bet. So I'm going to start sharing my screen here. Let me show, make, make sure this works. Okay. Can you all see this? Yes. Okay, cool. So um, hi, everybody. My name is Jan Kalp. I'm the co-founder of a startup called EIQ Mobility, and we're the leading provider of fleet electrification advisory services in North America. And what that means is that we um, provide the tools and the um, outcomes that fleets need to make decisions on EVs. As Kristen mentioned, it's a complex decision process. Um, there are dozens of EV OEMs, some of them very new to the market. Uh, same thing on chargers, rates, um, incentives, grants across the US, whether all this impacts the um, decision-making around the technical feasibility of converting to EVs and the economics, right? And so it's a complex process and we've built the most powerful tool um, in, in the market that automates and, 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 and provides those results. So, you know, we've, these numbers have changed. I think by the end of May, we'll have done 150,000 um, vehicles assessed, everything from sedans to tractor trailers and buses. We have a joint venture with First Student, First Transit, the largest um, um, public school and transit bus operator in North America. And you can see some of our clients here uh, you know, uh, PG&E, um, Ecolab, Ameren, the state of Oregon, PepsiCo, and, and, and others. So very exciting space to be in. Our real focus is on the um, demystification of the decision-making so that fleets can convert with their eyes wide open uh, and, and mitigating the operational and, and financial risk as much as possible. And so, you know, um, just a little framework of why we are so obsessed with fleets. Fleets is a big business, right? Everybody thinks about Teslas and, and, and Nissan Leafs, which is fine, right? It's a great market. But if you look at the 260 or so million vehicles operating in North America, in the US, at least 30 million of them are fleet vehicles, right? So if you aggregate all that, it's a 200 billion annual spend, um, you know, 300 billion miles driven. And it's one of the reasons why transportation is the number one source of carbon uh, emissions in, in North America, especially from fleets because diesels and trucks are all in fleets. So you can see what's happening. A bunch of, um, you know, public entities, corporations um, are converting or making commitments, including now the federal administration under uh, President Biden. And um, that's why the, the dynamics of sheets are so exciting. That being said, on to the next one. Unmute. All right. Hey, it's... <laughs> How are you doing? My name is Robert Bollinger. I am a founder of Bollinger Motors. 
Uh, if you don't know Bollinger Motors, let me show you my screen here. Go through a quick little thing here. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes. Should be all black right now. Little quick video. So um, that is the Bollinger B1 and B2 trucks. And basically those were vehicles that we started five years ago when I started the company. And since then we've added on a whole commercial aspect to what we're doing. And let me go through that real quick. Basically what we did is we, when we started those trucks, they were class three all electric trucks and we're kind of the first ones to start doing that. And that of course was because it could lead into a lot of commercial applications as well as the consumer. So those were the consumer trucks. If you follow us online or anything like that, you see we make tons of those cool videos showing our trucks doing lots of crazy cool things. But uh, what's great about it too is that it can go into a lot of commercial aspects, right? So this five years of doing um, uh, class three all electric leads right into fleet. So we've had a few announcements lately about our chassis cabs. I think we're the only ones making class three chassis cabs right now. I'm trying to find a way to put in this full screen mode here. Um, and we also have our chassis, which is underneath that, which is an all electric class three platform. So both of those are planned for production and for sale. So if you have any kind of vehicle you want to put on top of a uh, all electric or rear wheel drive vehicle, uh, that's our chassis. So airport tugs, mining equipment, anything like that, that's not, you know, doesn't need a full vehicle, right? As well as our chassis cab, which um, obviously is a huge market, chassis cabs and all the stuff that you can do with those. Uh, the chassis cabs and the chassis are going to come in all wheel drive, rear wheel drive, two door cabs, four door cabs, uh, dual rear wheel drive, which then can lead us up into class four. So this whole segment of class three and class four work trucks is a huge part of the market, right? A lot of them diesels, right? So we take a lot of emissions out of the air. Um, and obviously you can do anything with our trucks. What's great about all electric chassis cabs is the possibilities what you can do with all that energy that's on board, right? 140 kilowatt hour battery pack that we're going to be making that we've developed in-house ourselves as well. So we have all this energy on there, all this power on there. What, what can you do with fleets once you go all electric? I think we're only starting to think of what the possibilities are there. And of course, uh, total cost of ownership is going to be lower. That's true basically of all EVs compared to any gas or diesel. But even when they're even close to twice the cost initially, it's still a lower, a lower TCO over 10 years. So Lots of great, wonderful, beautiful things that are going to happen in the commercial front once we go all electric. And uh, our goal is to make, you know, consumer and commercial vehicles alongside each other to get economies of scale and work with all of our vendors who have been great with us so far. So uh, a lot more news on that coming up soon, but uh, that's a quick snapshot of what we're doing here. Great. Thanks, Robert. How exciting. That'd be fun to take across country. Yeah, there right. There you go. <laughs> Jeffrey, you're next. Yes. Well, good evening, everyone. It's really difficult to measure up to a presentation that is uh, that punchy. So, you know, after all that, what can you say? <laughs> good evening. My name is Geoffroy Tessanier de Gramont. Uh, I have been a corporate banker for uh, 25 years. And um, that uh, means that uh, I've started in Eastern Europe, in Western Europe. I've had the opportunity to work in Southeast Asia also, and uh, as in the two coasts of the, of the US. Um, for some reason, I cannot share my screen, but uh, I will try to do without for the moment. One of the particular trends that I've noticed throughout an international career, focusing uh, again on uh, automotive and mobility since 2009, is that as uh, population are clearly globally growing and concentration concentrating into cities. So since 2060s, the population on Earth has more than doubled, and this is not going to slow down. And as well as uh, concentration on cities, which means that from 
World War II until now, when 30% of the population only was urban, today it's going to be, or 2050 is going to be, um, thank you for that, is going to be uh, actually 70%. So if we can go down, screen, scroll down, yes which obviously have enormous impact on not only the ecosystem of urban cities themselves, but also globally on, on, the, on the world. The purpose of mobility, let's remember it, is to make uh, transportation cleaner, safer, and more accessible to, uh, to all. So if we can scroll down, please, to the next one. Thank you. And this ecosystem of mobility, which has been mentioned already, is connected, autonomous, shared, and electric, create those value chains. Those value chains, some of them tend to be become circular and virtuous, of which electrification and why fleets are important because out of the 28% of global greenhouse gases that uh, transportation uh, emits, fleets represent 60% of that. So that's a uh, primary uh, impact that we could have on the quality of life of people and on alleviating the pressure of population on earth is to address this particular topic. Thank you very much, let's continue. So while the, um, uh, transport, uh, the power sector in the US in particular has been for the last five years been able to decarbonize, it so happened that transportation not yet, simply because this, we are just at the beginning of the adoption of electrification. The good thing about uh, driving battery electric vehicle is that because the energy sector, the power sector, has been decarbonizing, becoming more renewable, and achieving the lowest cost uh, of um, uh, per kilowatt hour ever achieved uh, in, uh, in, in, in humanity so, uh, recently with solar power, that means that each mile that you drive in a battery electric vehicle is cleaner than the previous one, right? So. Uh, it is important for uh, banks uh, as well as all uh, policy makers to coordinate closely in order to make sure that this transition happen in the most efficient and quickest uh, uh, possible time frame. There, there is an urgency and we, um, uh, from there, we're gonna make sure that this is uh, coming to, to fruition, again, to the benefit of populations all over the world, right? Today um, at uh, Young America Capital, my firm, and by the way, I want to mention here that none of uh, our expert panelists, Joe, Robert, or Ian, are um, clients of the firm. So thank you very much for being here and accepting our invitation. Uh, that uh, we, uh, we want to make sure that uh, this will be uh, uh, enabled in, in the future. If we can move on a little bit, please. Thank you. Uh, further down. COVID impact clearly um, has been a black swan, you know, in the evolution of, of, of the world and is not resolved yet, it's, uh, we are, unfortunately, but clearly has changed the uh, transportation habits and this is uh, now uh, clearly the risk of infection has become at the top of the priority of uh, passengers uh, worldwide, which have enormous impact on not only private, but also public transportation. So we are really looking forward you know, together with uh, policymakers and, and, and entrepreneurs to enable this transition to uh, electric transportation, whether it is by creating new assets or by converting existing combustion engine fleets. And this is where Joe uh, starts to um, uh, play his role. And I'm going to pass him the button here. Thank you. Thank you, Jeffrey. Thank Appreciate you. it. Uh, can you guys see my screen? Yep. Fantastic. Well, thank you for the invitation. Appreciate uh, the invite from the forum. Uh, Kristen and James and, and Jeffrey, uh, great to participate tonight. My name is Joe Ambrosio, uh, President and CEO of Unique Electric Solutions. We're currently focused on bringing electric propulsion to buses and trucks. Uh, I've been in the industry for many years, and, and the opportunity for us really has emerged uh, 
in repowering vehicles, uh, existing vehicles. We, we're involved in new vehicles as well, but there's a tremendous amount of rolling stock, of course, uh, here in the United States, as, as Jan pointed out. It's all about the fleets for us. Uh, and, uh, you know, we're, we're really uh, tuned into that in a, in, in a big way. And uh, there's a demand to move quickly. Uh, and of course, we need new technology. We need, you know, Robert moving forward on the platforms that he's developing uh, and, uh, and the like. But uh, in a lot of situations, uh, you've got vehicles on the road that are going to be there for a while, right? Uh, so we enable fleets to move a little bit quicker uh, and de-risk some of that, uh, some of that, uh, some of that effort. I'll be talking later about infrastructure and whatnot, and, and we focus a lot about uh, human factors. So the the faster you can move to electrification uh, and getting fleets involved uh, in electrification and operating electric vehicles uh, with vehicles they recognize uh, is really important. Uh, and uh, it's provided a lot of uh, a lot of traction for us. So, currently we're focused on delivery vehicles. Uh, school bus market is tremendous for us, uh, getting a lot of traction there. Uh, and we're also developing a, a few vehicle platforms with existing, you know, body suppliers uh, with the with the skateboard that you see there. Um, not sure if I'll teach anybody anything here, but you know, it's really stark uh, when you just look at what you're pulling out of a vehicle, right? A lot of moving parts, a lot of components, uh, a lot of uh, replacing and maintenance items, and now you're replacing it with basically one moving part uh, and a good amount of uh, electronics that are way, way more efficient. Uh, so that's really you know, our business model and, and where we've been focused. Uh, look forward to participating uh, with the, the rest of the discussion panel uh, and the questions from the audience. So uh, looking forward and, and thank you very much. Great. Thank you so much, Joe. So, you know, lots of really great, excellent points are coming up. And um, Jan, I think I'm going to start with you, because as we look at kind of the economics of EV fleets, you know, and, and also that transition decision process, can you go into that a little bit more based on your experiences and what you're, what you're seeing? Yeah. Um, you know, you, it, you've got to put yourself in the shoes of a fleet operator. And, and there are only two things that really keep them going or keep them awake at night. One is operational reliability, right? Those trucks, sedans, buses need to work and they have a job to do. And in some cases, it's mission critical, right? When you're moving kids or you're moving um, or you're repairing power lines after a storm. And the second is they have a budget. And that might be a public budget that is taxpayer funded or it might be a corporate budget. But whatever the case, you have a budget. And blowing through your budget is not a good career move, right? So um, when they are making decisions around conversion to any new form of fuel, it could be electric, could be um, CNG or biodiesel, right? They're thinking about those characteristics and sustainability comes third, right? Things have to work first. Um, it's important, it's growing, but things have to work. So now what they're doing is they're trying to, to deal with multiple um, vendors and pieces of information, right? So we have Robert and, 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 and Joseph on the phone and there are others, right, who have awesome products. But how do you parse through all this data? How do you parse through the cost of energy, which varies state by state, utility by state, all the incentives, all the grants and all this. So what they're in a situation is information overload. And they, yes. have no, they have no process or no way to process that information overload and to make sense out of it. Right. And so the only way to solve this really is to pilot it. Right. We're mm -hmm. going to go and deploy two trucks. We're going to go and deploy three sedans. And that's a way to take very small risks and maybe delay the big questions as much as possible. Right. <laughs> right. right? Like, oh, okay, somebody else will take care of it when I'm retired. Right. But that's a way to solve the problem is do small pilots. You know, wave a, you know, do some pictures and some PR and, 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 you know, hope that somebody else will solve the problem for you. But it doesn't fun solve the fundamental problem of de-risking the conversion. So one way is decision making. The other one is that you alluded to at the beginning is, is the um, offsetting of risk to somebody else, right? Somebody else will own them. Somebody else will deploy them. Somebody else will charge them. And we will just lease them. Right. Right. And if they don't work, it's somebody else's problem. Right. So think I, I think it's really critical to think about how to reduce risk because fleets are no different than a, than a hospital or, a, you know, a manufacturing plant. Mm -hmm. Right. You want to run operations cost effectively. 
and with the high, highest level of, of uptime. Absolutely. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. And if, and, if I can add to that, yeah, please yeah a, big, a big part of that, because when we've talked to fleets, even well-known companies with large fleets, they kind of understand the electric vehicle side of it because we've had that in discussion now for quite a number of years, right? Mm -hmm. And they always go to like, well, how am I going to charge them? What's the infrastructure? You know, I have a, a depot that has 100 diesel trucks in it. Yeah. How do I switch that over to electric? They, they go there right away. So that's a big unknown, I think, to a lot of fleets is, yeah, 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 electric, I got it. I only go in this neighborhood. I have an electric car myself. I can see how that can, might work. But it's the full entire picture is a lot of yeah. stuff to try to figure out. So when infrastructure is in its infancy and you're talking about 100 trucks at a time. Yeah. yeah. Sounds a big part of it. And so, Robert, just to kind of go a little further, so, you know, you, what, what are the considerations then that you see in the differences um, as we go from fleets to regular? Let's kind of go on into that a little bit more, because I think most of us are really used to, of course, the regular and the issues that we have there and more. You mean consumer, consumer cars for yourself, consumer right? cars, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so um, a big part of it, you know, I'll touch on a couple of them, is, is really dependability, long last, you know, a long life cycle to the vehicle. You know, they want, I think fleet owners want to get a full 10 years out of their vehicle plus, and yeah, they're running on, the pos yeah, possibly running eight hours a day. That's a lot of use on that vehicle, as opposed to a consumer who might drive it to work. You know, the drive cycles you run your cars through in, you know, in, in simulation as you drive to work, you drive to lunch, you drive home. Yeah, it sits in my garage 95% of the day. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But fleets is like, could be eight hours all day, and then it's sitting for 16 hours, right? So... Uh, that's a big difference. Um, you know, that total cost of ownership, fleet on fleet operators already know that they're already comparing diesel to gas and all that kind of stuff. So that's a big thing. Whereas consumers, it's might be just, Oh, I want to do electric cause it's cool. Or I want to save the earth or, you know, it fits my, fits what I want to do. Whereas yeah. PCO I think is not a big sell. You know, electric will always be any other, you know, gas or diesel on TCO. So I think that's an easy sell for them. But that's a different way they're looking at it. That uptime again for that eight hours, they don't want it down for one minute during that eight hours because, you know, that's money. That's money. That's money lost. Um, and then range, I think range anxiety, I think is always, if we can talk for hours on this one, I always thought it was a made up term. Most people drive 28 miles a day. That's the on average. average yeah. If you drive 400 miles a day, I feel sorry for you and electric, you know, one day we'll, we'll cover that. But for you know, a lot of fleets, they really are 12, 20 miles a day. And so range, I don't think is an issue. You can have much smaller batteries. To some of the fleets we've talked to, even much larger vehicles, we've already calculated they can use a much smaller battery pack, which will bring down their cost because they that's really are only going yeah. 20 miles a day. So that's great. And then charging, the, in most cases, you don't need fast charging for fleets because again, they're sitting for 16 hours. They can slow charge, which is better for the battery, which makes the battery last 10 years or longer. So it's uh, it's kind of a different viewpoint in, in many ways, I think. So um, bi-directional charging, which we have on our trucks, mm -hmm. no one, you know, like someone with a, a Tesla or, a, you know, that's a, uh, isn't something that necessarily need right now. A lot of states don't allow you to put an electric back into the grid. But it's, if you have 100 vehicles sitting there, you might want to use the energy within your building move it around yeah that can make sense and Absolutely. connect to each other and that's where bi-directional would be huge where you're not even worrying about the grid how do you save yourself money and charge these five trucks from these other 10 trucks and then charge them later when the rates are lower all that kind of stuff so yeah it's a really interesting dynamic of questions and, and new thought processes to, to think about and yeah. you know what i'm gonna actually go to some of the q a that we have so um anyone can open this um considering the shift to ev though Thoughts about the battery packs and recyclability as e-waste is increased. I mean, yeah. Can I jump in on that one? Absolutely. I was talking to some, I, I was talking to some um, Stanford students who are working on a, on a startup project on, on that topic. If you look at the way, if you actually have fleet operating data, you can see that they have a distribution of their ranges. And like any distribution um, uh, of data, it's a bell curve, right? And so you have, you know, a small portion, actually it's got a very long tail that might be doing 300 miles a day and blah, blah, blah. But 
it, it, one of the major package delivery companies in, in the world um, um, works with us, right? And, and so we have data on some of that walk-in vans and things like that. And, mm-hmm. and, you know, out of the data that we have, um, 95% of their walk-in vans do under 100 miles a day and f- around 55% do under 50 miles a day. Okay. So let's assume that you have a brand new um, UES or Bollinger truck, right? That has a range of 250 or 300 miles or whatever it may be. 10 years from now, its range is deeply degraded and let's say it's hundred miles. Yeah. That still has a lot of fleet applications, right? Because, you know, think about a DHL um, van in New York City, right? So I, I think there certainly is going to be a, a recycling problem. But I think that it might be a further out. I, I'm not saying we, they will have to be recycled. Right? But I'm just saying is that the um, value and usage of those batteries is a lot more extensive than we yeah second life use cases i like to say right it's like there are it can go down that value stream and and have more use more life life you know use correct now they will have to be recycled at some point in time right but they have a lot of use yeah and then this is another question about oh jeffrey yeah yes i just wanted to mention here also that this recycling of batteries which is really by design how they are you know uh, inherently speaking we also alleviate the concern about the lack of uh, critical uh, mineral resources, lithium in particular, you know, which tends to sometimes be opposed to uh, the growth of the, of, of the fleets of uh, battery electric vehicles, right? Recycling will also help adoption in the future. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. And then someone has asked a question about proprietary, so like the charge point Rivian versus unlocked debate. Mm-hmm. <laughs> some thoughts on that, Robert. Uh, eventually, we're going to go to have to go to one standard. So, I mean, it just can't, Amen. <laughs> it can't, it can't be on the other. I mean, uh, every gas station, you know, it's it's again. That's why I don't really think there's charging anxiety. You know, electricity goes to basically every building in the U.S. So it's like gasoline doesn't go to every building, right? So it's like there's electricity everywhere. And I think just having one standard way to connect will take some of that confusion out. It's one of the things that anti-electric people kind of throw around a lot, you know, I think and a lot of range anxiety and this and that. So unfortunately it'd be nice if every automaker were to uh, agree to one, that would be nice, which is, it's obviously moving in that direction, but there's some holdouts obviously. And I think there's going to be a lot of pressure on, on uh, a lot of pressure, right? Because if you are, um, let's say a, you know, Amazon, right? And you're buying EVs by the tens of thousands and you're buying charging equipment, you know, in the thousands also. You're going to be putting a lot of pressure on your vendors to actually, you know, say, if you want to work with us, you're going to have to unlock your systems because you want to have um, sort of the capacity to work with multiple OEMs and multiple chargers based on, you know, your, you know, facilities, right? And simply to put pre- pricing pressure on on vendors, right? So being locked in is going to be very difficult for some of the major um, fleet operators to accept. So I think there's going to be a market pressure to to unlock. Even yeah. like you know, like with batteries, there's a you know a trend to move towards a common uh, dimensions and common form factor, right? So that you can have a hundred people making those cells and modules. So it's the same with the, all the connecting devices. They're not that expensive to make, right? But if they're all the same, they're being that, that much less money. So it's the same with everything, right? The more there are, the, the less they are. But Yeah, exactly. And so, you know, we've talked about a lot of great things on this innovation side. So Jeffrey, I'd like to get your thoughts. So how are we going to finance all this great innovation? Well, thank you for asking it, Christine. Uh, clearly, uh, this is when uh, bankers uh, try to become people like Joe or Robert, and this is not necessarily a good idea, right? Uh, it's always better <laughs> listen to their clients. And that. Um, innovation, essentially, uh, is uh, at, the, at the minimum, you know, if you reduce it to its simplest form, what becomes eventually a patent or a trademark for you, right? This is a great idea that keeps you up at night and for months on end, you know, you keep on going at it. 
without any certainty of results. You know, you don't know if you're going to make it, you don't know what is going to be worse, you don't know if it's going to be marketable or anything. Before you get this uh, market product that you can finally sell, it also implies a lot of different capital costs. You know, this is not the only thing that you need to finance. You need to finance capital expenditures, which are those long-term fixed assets, which have a specific behavior. You also have your working capital, that is anything from supplies to paying your employees, hopefully. And eventually yourself, once you get there, you already have something which is tangible and which can completely be uh, financeable. So each of those capital calls have a specific risk profile and therefore attract different discount rates. When you are an entrepreneur launching, well, you tend to obviously try to go step by step, building block by block, you know. And you will obviously start by doing, you know, by putting your own money into the, uh, any venture because uh, not only uh, you need to have skin in the game, but you also are the skin in the game for any future, let's say, ingredients of your body, the backbone, the muscles, you know, that's going to make, you know, the whole body work and run eventually. You're going to call then your families and friends and hopefully your story will end up better than Bill and Melinda's because, you know, uh, obviously, you know, and then you eventually, you know, maybe go uh, to get grants and uh, it seems that the administration, depending on their orientations, you know, will favor or not at different levels, whether they are federal or local, different uh, subsidies that help you to get, uh, you know, to the next step, right? Eventually, you're going to find angel investors, you know, who can provide the first seed, let's say, of external money to you. Those include high net worth individuals, you know, family offices and bunch of capital funds. This is when eventually you're going to start by uh, growing and keep on starting a series A or maybe a bridge to a first series A. This is when you possibly have a convertible loan, right? For example, this is an, an example. And this is where you're going to grow again, step by step, milestone by milestone until, you know, you reach eventually the, um, uh, the, the, the size where you're going to decide possibly that you choose to become public, right? And that is another adventure uh, that uh, we uh, recommend to be uh, very carefully uh, charted and which leads to the question of which are the best investors at these earliest stages, right? And this is where we will recommend to think about the wide spectrum and the deep pool of possible investors, whether you will have strictly financial, passive, hands-off investors, or on the contrary, very active industry players that would provide, for example, operational leverage, whether this is helping you achieve economies of, of scale uh, on the supply, chain, uh, supply chain, or help you on the distribution side, right? Or maybe help you with a specific technology that you need to, to acquire. What we would certainly recommend all the time is for uh, the entrepreneur to pick and choose uh, uh, an investors, a partner that A, will be with them for the long term, which is not for one shot. You now it needs to go and grow with the company. Two, that helps you build you know, your company as opposed to simply providing a check, right? Mm -hmm. about uh, what uh, we would uh, recommend. And obviously, we would recommend that uh, you use uh, for your um, series uh, capital raise a nationally registered SEC slash FINRA registered um, broker dealer. Because if you don't and you want to eventually become public, you may run into legal problems eventually. So it's important that you build trust with your advisors. And this is what bankers try to do with all of you. Thank you. Yeah, and Jeffrey, so one of the, someone asked a question, and um, this is kind of relating to this. It says, you know, assuming the huge expansion of incentives and credit instruments, what bottlenecks do all of us see between the money, the money itself and effectively spending that money, right? Utilities in the States. Um, uh, well, I would say that the bottlenecks would be that there is a plethora of capital out there, but there are a few only right partners for you out there, right? And the accessibility of this capital is really determined by the quality of the projects. So you have this kind of segmentation and you need to be sure that you find the right capital at the right time for your, in your evolution curve. 
All right, so get to know where you are, understand. And honestly, if you can spend as little time as possible on funding, well, you know, entrepreneurs should spend their time building their shops and not uh, do funding or financing. Okay, mm -hmm. this is uh, something for people who are less intelligent than them, you know, less entrepreneurial, <laughs> and therefore, you know, uh, are left uh, to uh, to mere bankers like us. That's great. I could make a comment about the funding thing, um, Robert. I believe. I hope there is a. Uh, uh, effort from the new funds that will be coming from federal level to remember the little guy, right? The little, right? Uh, yeah, the little in, guy. You know, the smaller companies, because as we saw with PPP loans at the beginning, you know, huge corporations took 90% of that money. So there's just a lot more um, resources and, and power behind larger corporations to get funding. They have teams of people working on that kind of stuff. So, and that's great, you know, if it all goes towards electrification and, and, and you know, the super truck fund that uh, came out just recently, you know, for classes four through eight, you know, there's a lot of players in that. Um, and, and so I think it's a matter of, I, hopefully it's all the funding doesn't go to the top six companies that are already heavily, you know, making money from electric already yes it will help them mm -hmm. you know make the whole world electric i get it but hopefully there's not just a not just a trickle down uh, theory here going on with the funding right that like it's it's different niches in different markets and different and different companies have a true chance at yeah. it we stuck at that, that we're we're i'm talking about myself obviously obviously about bollinger motors and smaller companies so you know uh we're second that's that very market. sure the better good yeah. of all yeah. Well, and, and I think um, <clears throat> the necessity to fund the technologies is real. And we and and, and uh, Jeff and, and and Joe and Robert are talking about that. Um, I, I think it's also necessary to think about the funding of the fleets, right? Because fundamentally, fleet vehicles have to be purchased, right? I mean, whether they're diesel or electric doesn't change the fact that they need to be purchased, right? and or least right so and the let's face it right for the next few years the upfront costs of evs are higher although the total cost of ownership is a lot more attractive or can be a lot more attractive over time there is an upfront capital outlay and the charging infrastructure is not free either right you're actually going to build out maybe over time, a third of all infrastructure in the US, whether it's on the grid or the building side, so before the meter, behind the meter, or, or um, before the meter, has to be built out. So, we're, I mean, Morgan Stanley did some research, I, I forget what it is, in trillions of dollars for Europe and the US, massive. So, who's going to fund that? Right. So now there are huge opportunities to fund it. Right. Next era is a funder of this type of stuff. Our, our parent co a company, they spend six to nine billion dollars a year on, on wind farms and, and solar systems. Right. And there are others. But somebody needs to fund it. And frankly, it should not be the public purse. So here uh, I've got good news. I, I think uh, we see really the emergent because what you're talking about really is about risk transfer. Who is going to own the assets? And then with the assets, how do they behave economically, right? And this is when you need to realize that electric vehicles tend to have much longer lifetimes than combustion engines. They have much lower operating um, cost, clearly, right? This is electricity. Uh, and has much less wear and tear um, and, 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 and very little ma maintenance cost also. I mean, so, you're absolutely right, Jeffrey, about that full cost of ownership equation. Yes, absolutely. Good news is that we see the emergence now of new companies of another kind who are becoming dedicated to the mm -hmm. electric vehicle asset class. So um, that means that uh, you know, the whole equation is to be rewritten for the specific behavior of the assets. This is still emerging, so we have little data historically, but you know, if you consider residual values, which is essential, you know, um, in, in variable in this equation, they tend to be much higher than combustion energy. You know, that means that the total cost of the funding of the assets yeah. is lower, right? Because it depreciate less. So those companies are happening uh, as we speak, and we have uh, great hopes that they will eventually 
set the standards uh, about depreciation and residual values, and that the largest founders out there, which are, by the way, the OEM's credit companies, right, uh, will uh, adopt them and really put the effort uh, to uh, maybe create financing products which are specific, again, to the very nature of electric vehicles. Yeah, really good point. And, you know, in terms of the cost, I would, I'd like to get into the infrastructure a little. And Joe, want to want to pick your brain for a while in terms of more detail you've alluded to in your doc about that infrastructure needed. And we actually have a good question here about, you know, kind of like this is kind of an adjunct about commercial vehicles. Their question is like, so, for example, long haul tractor trailers traveling in rural areas. Could there be a risk of no charging station when needed? And could the vehicle be stranded? So if you can just go into that that infrastructure angle a little bit more, that'd be great. Yeah, absolutely. I'd definitely like to talk about operational infrastructure and human factors. I mean, let's just for a moment, just for a moment, assume that the electric vehicle part is the easy part and it's done and they, they show up. Um, it's really interesting now, I, you know, it's really interesting. I mean, uh, you've got fleet directors who, almost with a look of fear in their eyes saying, here's an aerial shot of my parking lot and look at all these school buses. They have to be in that, that area all the time. I'm not going to change that. You know, there, there's certain value to that parking spot and to the number of vehicles in that lot. So you need to work within those parameters. Uh, and, you know, how are you going to accomplish that? And these are the big challenges now that we feel uh, or we're, we're seeing come up. Uh, so, yes, the technology is important, the disruption needs to be there, uh, but we need to look at the, the practical uh, sort of factors and issues around these fleets being deployed. Um, you know, training, uh, training drivers, training technicians, you know, what, you know, what is the, the, the line there? Uh, and it's very interesting. There's a lot of segmentation regionally, vocationally, on how that all takes place. And <clears throat> over many, many years of operation, uh, these vocations uh, have gone sort of to their corners and operate a certain way. So there's an interesting mashup and, and cross section here where people are looking at electric vehicles that are available uh, and they may not fit exactly on how they buy parts or how they maintain vehicles. So there's a, a very interesting realignment that's going on. Uh, and I, I think it's a, kind of a wake up call to some of the vehicle suppliers. I know it has been to us in terms of saying, well, you know, you've got the best solutions. It's about TCO. Uh, it's about, uh, you know, efficiency and, and getting the job done. Uh, but now there's kind of everything else that, the way in terms of an, how an organization operates. And it can be very, very different. Uh, so understanding that and listening uh, is extremely important. Uh, and then also understanding the corporate culture, you know, what's driving this? Is it about TCO? Is it about being green? Uh, and how, how does that proliferate, you know, within the company? Uh, and you really need to, you know, uh, understand it, uh, help develop it where you can, uh, but also really go with the flow, right? Because at the end of the day, all these companies are, they have a job to do. Uh, and they, they, they want to change the way they transport goods and services, uh, but it, 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 they're not going to redesign their, their operation overnight. Uh, so that's a, that's a big piece of it. Uh, maintenance, uh, long term, short term, you know, how you source parts. Um, some companies have a different business model in terms of, you know, how they approach that. Uh, the, the, you know, some companies uh, basically uh, have you uh, sort of work within a certain pool of components that you buy from them. Others tend to source a little bit more globally that, you know, you might be able to source on, on you know, on your own. Uh, so a lot of different fleets, you know, operate uh, differently from, from that regard. Uh, so continuous, you know, learning there. Uh, and as far as, you know, vehicles being stranded, I mean, I, I think there are certain things that just have to be worked out in terms of logistics, in terms of where you operate. Uh, we just talked about, you know, unlocking uh, and making uh, the charging accessibility uh, more ubiquitous. Uh, I think there's a little bit of a land grab that's going on there uh, as far as why some of these things are, are locked the way they are. But at the end of the day, you need to pull up to a charging station and uh, and, and be able to, to, to plug in there. Yeah. So... Um, uh, I think, like I said, you know, the the this technology disruption, absolutely, you know, we need that to get to where we need to go. But I think we need to really look at the human factors, uh, uh, and uh, they're probably just as important, if not more, in some cases, yeah. uh, to getting the job done in the vehicles out there. And uh, to the point of the range thing, that kind of question, like where you're stranded, no one's going to get right. stranded in an electric vehicle because a fleet owner is not going to buy a vehicle until it's all figured out. They, they're going to buy it right, once they know risky. it was like, 
Oh, Goes my bus risk issue. My bus goes 10 miles and it comes back. <laughs> End of story. You know, like, you right. know, the, you know, like, you know, the, the charging could be put in. There's tons of money. There's lots of companies like Jan's company that are going to be, be providing financing to put in infrastructure. We're going to get there. It just makes me think like, like in 1901, was everyone going, where are we going to get gas? Oh my God. What are we going to do about gas? That happened, said the same right? thing. So we're just trying to do the electric thing on all fronts, on all, on all areas, every single part of it as quickly as possible. And we're all like pulling our hairs out. It's just like, it's still, it still is the case that's 1% of vehicles are electric. And of course we want to get up to yeah. 40% and 50% and all that kind of stuff. By the time that number of vehicles there are, the infrastructure is, is the vehicles are going to be, the infrastructure is going to be waiting for the vehicles to come. You know what I mean? It's, there's, I don't think there's going to be any issue like that. But well, Robert, no. you make a great point about the history too, right? And that convergence. And so think back right. to like the automobile. The horse and carriage people in the early 1900s were saying the horse and carriage will never be taken over by the automotive and then right. within a span of 10 years you see new york city fifth avenue and it flipped right before you could see one horse you know one car and then in 10 years it was the reverse one horse and yeah. carriage and so i think we're going to have that that kind of complete convergence and, flipping and bicycles had a quick surge for like two years and yeah. i want to go i want to go faster than this and then went to cars yeah. so it was like yeah, bicycles really can teach us that. a lot i think yeah, I, I, I think it's important not to, to, to not get into the mindset where you need to solve all transportation problems before solving some of them. Right. And yes, there are over the road trucks that drive through rural areas that are not suitable for electrification anytime soon. Yes, correct. But that's a tiny fraction or at least a fraction of the fleet. Right. There are an infinite number of vehicles for consumers or fleets with package delivery and school buses and cities and counties that are all hub and spoke. They come back to, I, I, you know, um, I think Joe was talking about that, you know, they come back and they park for 10 hours and, you know, like there's an infinite number of that and that can be solved. Granted, there is going to be a long tail of unsolvable vehicles for a very long time. And the market will take care of that. But if we're waiting all on the side saying, I want perfect, then I'm guessing that none of us would ever had a job, never have gotten married, never had, <laughs> Absolutely. Never had right. done anything in our lives. There if you go, wait Jan. For perfect, right? Like when we f first came out with our truck, you know, it, five years ago, I started this company and everything has changed since then. When we were first developing our car, there were no vendors to give, you know, it was like a, it was, it was crazy. It was like the wild, wild west when you would go to a, the battery show here in Novi, it was like 40 people and everyone's like, what's right? that? You know, it's like, that was like six years ago. So everything's changing crazy fast. But, um, but when we first came up with our truck and showing it going off road, people were like, oh great, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna off road to the top of a mountain and run and, and be stuck. And I'm be like, a dead battery. You yeah. wouldn't do that in a gas vehicle. You know exactly <laughs> the length of your thing. You know you're coming back. And by the way, our, our vehicle can go for 10 hours off roading, by the way. But the first question is, I'm gonna get stuck on top of that mountain. Well, no, you're not, but I don't, I don't know how to help you if you do. Because <laughs> it's your problems. own fault. But I don't know. That is what Ford, you know, was uh, answering. Henry Ford, you know, the, was answering a journalist uh, famously and uh, asking him, you know, what would why why did you invent the, the car? Right, almost, you know, the Ford T. Because if you asked and Ford answering, if you ask people what they wanted, they would have answered a faster horse, right? And he made the car revolution. Yeah, that's a classic line. Yeah, it's a good one. And so we have a question in in the Q and A about kind of what I call the sustainability of it in terms of if there's increased um, electric vehicles being used and then they require more electricity and power plants, then it increases, you know, basically more pollution. So how is the overall environmental impact if there's more electric vehicles overall? I'll, 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 <laughs> I'll start with this one because we studied this. Um, if you look at the distribution of carbon reduction for um, about 20, 22,000 vehicles we studied last year, the carbon reduction is anywhere from 92% to actually negative, right? So there's a, or, or like 10, 10% reduction. So it's, some of it is excellent. So if it's in Oregon or, you know, Washington state, lots of hydroelectric, huge carbon reduction opportunities. But this is, this is the same, this is the same. Well, first of all, the grid is decarbonizing at warp speed, right? So Nextera and others are 
um, you know, Dominion just made an announcement today, Portland General, there's, um, the entire grid is decarbonizing. It's de decarbonizing very, very quickly, way faster than anybody thought. And the retirement of coal assets is, 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 at, is going at warp speed. So it's decarbonizing. But this is also saying, well, if we have to use more electricity, we'll have to build more coal plants. That's not the way it works. There is already a cost-effective source of energy that is clearly directionally going towards renewables. So as the grid, um, you know, um, or the, the load increases, there is really no reason why that new electron that's being built for the purpose of an EV is not a clean electron versus a coal electron. Yeah, there's yeah. a lot of improvements in sustainable energy now. It's amazing, yeah. like the difference and in then, the solar panels 30 years ago versus today. Right. And with now, one, now there is, uh, no, go ahead, Robert. Sorry, with 1% of the vehicles electric, electric cars aren't really tapping the grid all that much. You know what I mean? Like our electric use has gone through the roof because of a million other reasons, right? All the electronics we use every day that we have to keep recharging, stuff like that. So uh, in that time of extra, you know, more electric use, coal plants have been closing, right? So it won't be electric cars that cause any crazy, you know, new thing to electric anytime soon until we get to a huge mass of them. But yeah, you can go online and easily find out how much of your state's electricity is green. You know, some states are already over fifty percent, so it's it's huge, huge yeah, and, change. And, yeah, and 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 um, you know, the the total national load is dwindling, right? Because we are consuming more electricity, but the appliances and industrial processes we're using are more efficient. So there's a trade off, but fundamentally, load is in decline. So some of the load decline is going to be offset by EVs, and that's just filling a gap, right? So that we can, that's not a problem. I think one of the interesting parts that I don't have an answer for because I'm not a grid expert is really when vehicles charge, right? So if they fundamentally charge at night when people are sleeping, right? Whether at home or at a, for a fleet. Yeah, balancing out the loads. Absolutely. Right, that's not, that's not ideal solar time, right? So Yeah, so, not at all. <laughs> It's, it's not it's not a perfect it's not i don't you know there's not a perfect solution and there is you know charge management and charge optimization that needs to happen but the 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 research from you know um lawrence berkeley national lab and others indicates that you know f transportation electrification it does not equ equate to you know more emissions also the emissions at the tailpipe are a lot more hazardous than emissions at other plants that have at a lot more regulation on them and have to clean the air a lot more. So just any, every, each tailpipe you take off the road is for the better regardless, even if it is coming from a natural gas, you know, power plant. Yeah. And so uh, what type of industry will be the next to electrify their fleet? So who's, who's ready? Who's ripe and ready? A lot of people are talking about air, airplanes, but I don't know how close that is. Is that what you mean? Whole industries like that? This is our, one of our attendees asked for the question of what types of industries. Yeah. You know, I've, I've read things about, you know, hydrogen fuel cell boats and all these fun things. So we see a lot of rail, a lot of activity on the rail side, uh, which uh, kind of came out of nowhere. A lot of uh, yard, uh, yard trucks that move around rail cars and whatnot. Uh, our local uh, uh, metro is looking to do some all electric uh, trains now instead of putting down a third rail. Uh, so that was sort of a bit of a surprise. Uh, we're actually bidding some some uh, some of these uh, yard movers uh, in, in South America. So uh, an interesting, you know, interesting growth area there. Nice. And Joe, kind of space dad. travel could ever, it'd be nice if space travel didn't have to, you know, get off, you know, pull away from gravity <laughs> with so much uh, burning. Right? <laughs> yeah, each time. I'm sure uh, we can figure that out. Yeah, every, each time a rocket goes up, like how many vehicles is that, you know, equivalent? But, <laughs> Quite a lot of pollution. There you go. And uh, so, Joseph, there's a, another question that that I have here in terms of typical turnaround time for an ICE to EV conversion. You know, when you're talking like class four to seven truck or bus, 
So, you know, and is there ways to bring that turnaround time using like things like robotics and automation techniques and things like that? So just what's your vision? We'd just like to pick your brain on that. Yeah, right now it's, it's sort of an assembly line process. Uh, we've got it down to about the 60 man hours. Um, we developed a process Pretty around good. it, you know. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of a manual process in terms of, you know, removal of the engine, cleaning up the vehicle and whatnot, kind of a, 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 a retro mod, if you will. Uh, so I'm not sure if it will be mechanized at, at some point, but uh, the idea is that it's pretty straightforward. I mean, the wonderful thing about the, the standardization of the truck and bus industry is that, you know, things tend to be in the same place, a lot of the same components. So developing a process around that has been, uh, uh, you know, sort of central to what we do and, and uh, pretty straightforward. So, uh, you know, with the, our approach uh, mm -hmm. uh, from, from our perspective is to try to be narrow and deep in terms of, you know, the, the, a, a lot of things look different from the outside, but you've got a lot of the same chassis and, and running gear underneath uh, so that uh, lends itself nicely uh, to setting up processes around it so yeah. uh, timing's not so bad and uh, you could uh, you could build around it but also it's it's really a pathway uh, to, to doing it better uh, you know uh, in, a, in a new vehicle a factory setting yeah excellent we have another really good question too on everyone's thoughts here on alternative methods for on-site power generation that lowers that burden for local utilities and the grid itself what are your thoughts? Well, I, so <clears throat> I, it is a real topic, right? It, it, um, there's a, there's an, an, a need for resilience, right? And because those vehicles have a job to do, right? And so if there is a power outage, how do you guarantee your capacity for the vehicle to do its job? So resilience is important. Sometimes there's already a rub, robust market for on-site clean generation, you know, solar arrays and, and, and so forth. Um, we have a partnership with um, um, a linear um, gas generator called MindSpring um, that that enables kind of it, it, it's a load following generator. So it's actually capable of actually supporting a variable load on a facility. So it could be a hospital, could be anything, right? But including vehicles. Um, I, I think the the question that I'm not capable of answering is how does that support the full load of a fleet, right? So if you have you know, um, 100, um, you know, UES vehicles or Bollinger vehicles or others, right? The magnitude of that load mm -hmm. to be <clears throat> self-generated on premise, I, you know, I, I don't know how you can, I don't know how you can do that, right? Well, you can do it through optimization, maybe. Go ahead, go ahead, Jeff. Well, I was wondering which storage of power be, uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, possibly palliative to that? I think it's a bit of everything. I mean, at the, you know, we've been talking about underutilization of battery capacity and whatnot. So I think it comes down to the time, right? I mean, I think if it's a few day outage, it's, you know, one response or one perspective, if you're looking at, you know, a lot more than that. Uh, but uh, you'd be pretty surprised in terms of, you know, how long a fleet can go, you know, even with, with some of the vehicles we're deploying, they really don't need to charge every day. Uh, so you, you need to have a mitigation plan, uh, but uh, it's it's not it's not all doom and gloom. And with some of the things that Yan is talking about, you you can have some you know some support to that uh, if the grid disappears completely. I mean, it can't go away forever, uh, but uh, you could ride through some of these gaps. Does anyone have actual experience though on the alternative methods? I'm just curious. Well, we when we uh, we get probably our third most popular question to us is, will you put solar panels on top of the truck? Ah, uh, yeah. So it can power itself, <laughs> Perpetual right? Perpetual motion machine. Yeah, yeah. Right. And we did the math. I think it'd be like 600 hours to, you know, to charge the battery from solar on, you know, perfectly sunny day. So it's like, you know, for that much space. So, of course, solar is great. It's become extremely efficient. It's, you know, outpacing wind in many ways. But... But uh, yeah, to, have, to be able to create your own energy at your own spot for one vehicle is, is kind of difficult, let alone a fleet. You know, so it'd be, I'm not sure what the answer is for there, but you know, it's really the infrastructure, again, all these states that long before electric vehicles got so hot uh, as a topic, you know, a lot of states said we need to go green with the way we make our electricity, you know, yeah. completely separate from the electric vehicle uh, discussion. So it, that's, that's where, again, that mass, you know, the efficiencies of large scale production is always going to outdo, I would guess, you know, local generation of, of energy. And Robert, someone asked you specifically a question. If your customers experienced a lack of personal finance seeing options when banks rely on NADA listings, 
to determine the LTV calculations. So how yeah. do manufacturers achieve those residual values in starting out? So what have been your experience on that? Yeah, well, we're not, not in, uh, yeah, we're not in production yet, um, on, you know, soon. So we don't have that, but we've we've discussed that at length. Yeah, yeah that's that definitely is an issue. It's definitely, uh, it's one of those things, again, where I think the, the world as we know it needs to just kind of put on a different thinking hat and say, True. you know, this is what it's going to be. Um, I know that vehicles made by very, well-known companies don't have that issue as well because you know the electric golf what's the residual value of an electric golf you know it's very different from everything else so uh yeah that's an industry-wide concern that hopefully changes but yeah yeah needs to change absolutely sure and, and it's key for any leasing right because a lease a lease value is based on its expected residual value and right. so then yes yeah. financing becomes problematic right chicken and egg. Correct. I Another mean, question about research. Oh, go ahead, Jan. You know, there's a lot of data on Teslas and lease and, and bolts, but that's, you know, those are three OEMs out of all. Right. Of so back to you. Yeah. So another question about resource limitations, right? So they said, is there a limit set by resources like lithium to the number of vehicle battery packs that can even be made? Well, that whole industry is moving away from rare metals. So um, and moving towards abundant metals, you know, it's a big, yeah, broad, which big, is broad be a big statement help. there. So, which everyone could tear apart probably, but it is mm -hmm. an issue that is um, mostly more so for geopolitical reasons, right? Certain countries have certain things that other countries want, so they're going <laughs> to there's going to be a lot of money put into development that you don't have to rely on those other countries, right? That's going to be the main issue. So, I think it's going to definitely become, you know, there's already battery chemistries out there that don't rely on. On those rare earth metals exactly yeah. so it's all going to go in that way it's all going to become very standardized a uh, lot cheaper we're going to hit those those price points that you had in your presentation of you know the, the turning point and uh, a, a lot more safety too because a new you know chemical uh, combos are a lot less you know a lot less thermal runaway you know that's kind of going to be a thing of the past as well so I yeah. think you need to consider recycling as well. I mean, if you look at uh, just lead acid as an example, right, we've had 100 years of operation there, and there's not a lot of new lead mined. You know, there, there's uh, <laughs> no batteries are recycled. I mean, 99.99% <clears throat> of a lead acid battery is, is, is part of the, 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 the stream there. Uh, so, you know, same thing here. I mean, we haven't hit, you know, critical mass yet on, on lithium, but, you know, on, uh, you know, th there's plenty of lithium. It's at what cost, you know, does it, uh, th does it take to get out of the ground? Uh, but, uh, you know, once we have, you know, good recycling in place, I mean, that's going to be, I don't want to say self-supporting, but uh, pretty, pretty good if you look at, you know, if you look at lead as an example. Yeah. And also yeah. the refining of certain metals is really a dirty business. There's a lot there that people don't realize is happening. There's, that's why certain only certain countries can refine certain things because they don't have the laws, right? So there's a yeah. whole thing about, you know, the, the entire battery industry is getting cleaner and moving away from all of that stuff. So just, just like each state is getting greener with its, how it's making electricity, those, those, all those items that use it are getting more and more efficient, right? Cars, iPhones, everything. So. Yeah, we are very innovative and creative as a as a world. And so my thing is, is, you know, we are figuring this out, as you said, Robert. And, you know, it kind of goes back to I remember when I was an internship at Digital Equipment in their high performance disk drive. And here I am with experts and they're building a five and a quarter inch big box. That's one gigabyte. And they really thought they were maxing out technology. So I always remember <laughs> that story. <laughs> it's a good life lesson. Yeah, and look, and, you know, by the way, and you know, we're we're in a capitalist society, right? And 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 demand and supply tends to follow very well when there's demand, right? So, I I, I would suspect that the capacity for this country for the world to to develop more gigafactories to produce more batteries and find um you know the compromise of of chemistry and 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 mining. I'm no expert, but I would suspect that you know. Right. Supply just like, just like yeah. none, none of the, no automotive com, uh, company would be making electric vehicles if it wasn't for Tesla making a lot of money, right? <laughs> Tesla, you know, going the way it's not, it's not just incentives that got them to do it or law changes. It's like, oh crap, the Tesla Model S is the, you know, is the number one selling vehicle in Southern California. You know, that's, that's what got them to do it. So. 
And yeah, I'm going to just ask a, a little bit on supply chain, because, you know, Robert, you brought up a good point about, you know, kind of the small guys and kind of your issues of getting, you know, the vehicle financing options. And so in terms of supply chain, here we're hearing all about the chip shortages and stuff. So how, how are you working out securing your future, you know, especially as a smaller up and coming automaker? Uh, what's been good for us um, in an odd way is that back when we started five years ago, there, you know, there weren't any, there's far fewer components available uh, to anyone trying to make an electric vehicle. The big names out there that are now getting into it or started maybe like a year or two ago, they're in that low volume stage of their own components. So they're still making 99.999% of their components for uh, gas vehicles. And that one little bit, they want to start out at the 1,000 or 2,000 units a year kind of place, even though they're a big company, they're well-known names. And so we fit that area. So we believe that we can grow with those companies because they're not necessarily the providers to, you know, these big names yet where they can make a hundred thousand, you know, onboard chargers or a hundred thousand DC, DC converters, all that kind of stuff. So all those com millions of expensive components that are in electric vehicles that no one knows about, and there's really no reason you should, and you, you can't touch them. Uh, so all those, there's a lot of companies that make the smaller volume. So that's been good for us. Um, but really it's a matter of, of, you know, we have to pay the, we have to pay more than for GM and yeah, you don't have that uh, scale. We don't have the scale. We have to pay a lot more to people work with us because we have higher risk, lower volume, the whole thing. So, um, it's really a matter of scale and, and power. You know, you have to get to the point where someone really wants to work, wants to work with you, can see making money off of you. But like I said, a lot of those companies are in that stage where they were making prototypes, you know, last year and the year before when we were as well, and we can move into production with them. So um, with all the years of testing, you know, once you really, you know, you know this, once you get into automotive, like all this stuff people don't know, like years of testing, years, years, of, like it's just, it's astronomical. So the amount of cost and time to, to get something on the road. So all these people who have deposits with us, there's, there's, you know, we're, we're doing all that work, but uh, yeah, that's how I, I see it is, is we have good, um, we have good tier ones, that are behind us. Really. Yeah, that's good. And, and Jeffrey, you know, kind of going back on financial. So one of the attendees had asked a question about the batteries, right? And in terms of financing, so why can't the batteries be separated from the vehicle financing and have a new operation, operating lease model on the batteries and a capital lease on the vehicle? Well, you know, batteries represent still about what 30 to 40 percent of the total cost. Uh, I mean, up from sticker price. I mean, of, of a battery electric vehicle, depending on the OEM, uh, as uh, Robert mentioned, right? So, in theory, that, that makes sense. In practicality, you would have to to wonder: Do you swap the battery after 10 years, for example, right? And that's uh, something that's possible, but it has never been tested because there are no personal cars that have uh, electric vehicles that have been lasting for 10 years, right? That have been needing that. In the future, certainly it's possible. And the leasing of those batteries could be um, in theory depreciated over 10 years and could make sense if you would remain and keep the, the shell out of it. This would be in itself a new asset class that would be um, have to be financed and probably would depend um, uh, be a function of the chemistry or the make uh, of, the, um, of, the, of the battery, whether it's you know, an MC or, or LFP uh, on the residual qualities of the battery. So in theory, it's possible. It's never been done or tried in practice. Any other it, thoughts or comments? Weren't, weren't there a couple of companies a uh, few years ago that were looking into that? The idea of like selling the vehicle but leasing the battery or something yeah. like that. Just so so, yeah, so the, Terra did this or so still does it, right? The for, the, for, for buses. Yeah, the forklift industry does this. Uh, they've been doing this for years. They call it power by the hour or guaranteed power. You buy a forklift, battery's not included, and then you engage with somebody else on the battery. Hmm. So it's been done on the industrial or bus side, but not on the personal car side. Right. Okay. Or fleets. Or fleets. 
So what I'm going to do, I mean, this is a really love the dialogue, lots of great uh, questions from the audience. And what I like to do in terms of panels is um, kind of end it with what I call my rapid fire question here. I'm going to ask each of you, can you have like a minute? Maybe I'll give you a minute and a half to answer. Um, and I'm going to start with you, Joe. So tell me, why are you optimistic about the future of transportation? So I look at this sort of as my third wave uh, in the industry. You know, a lot of a lot of the past has been driven by fuel prices or regulatory. Uh, there's a lot of resolve now in fleets. Uh, we walk in, we used to start talking about golf carts. You know, have you been in an electric vehicle before? But just a tremendous amount of education. You know, people feel it's uh, it's coming at every level uh, and they're determined to do it. Uh, so uh, a lot of optimism, you know, all other forces aside, just people are driving towards the desire to do it, whether it's parent groups or you know, the fleet operators themselves, just uh, a lot of enthusiasm. So, so you know, we feel that uh, it's real and it's here to stay. Great. Love that. Jeffrey, what what makes you optimistic about the future of transportation? Well, I think that because uh, first the science has been done, you know, and now is accessible to all. And the more electric vehicles start to dissipate in the economy, the more people will be the, proof of concept will be done and uh, we will finally achieve this, you know, this safer, cleaner and more accessible transportation for all, all over the world. So that's a big hope for the next generation. Yes. Excellent. Jan, how about you? What makes you optimistic? So I'm, I'm very optimistic about the, the, the sheer magnitude of what we're talking about, right? Because if you look at the automotive value chain, I forget what it is, but it's like trillions of dollars, right? And in the next 10 years, none of that is going to exist anymore. I, I deeply believe this, right? The oil and gas industry is going to go through a lot of pain. The traditional OEM segment is going to go through a lot of pain. The value chain that surrounds it, insurance, gas stations, mechanics, etc., is going to go through a lot of pain. What we're going to end up with is a significantly smaller transportation industry, but a significantly cheaper transportation industry, which means that the actual unit cost per mile is gonna drop dramatically between a combination of electric, autonomous and, and rideshare. And Tony Seba has written about this, it's fascinating. But we're, we're talking about a personal revolution that we will all experience in the next 10 years, in our, in our lifetimes, I hope for, for all of us that is absolutely going to be mind-blowing from a cost and carbon and, and, and sort of quality of transportation experience. I'm, I'm very, very excited about that. Love that. Great. And Robert? I wish you, I wish you had ended. That was, that was a wonderful, uh, <laughs> wonderful <laughs> look. On the, um, I'm very optimistic because optimistic we will be in production. So just personally, Ooh, okay. our vehicles will be in production. So <laughs> really looking forward to that. Uh, personal note, but... Uh, but really, again, that we've only been at this for five years. We're a very young company. But in that five years, so much has changed on the electric front, electric vehicle front. It's incredible. So I can't even imagine now with this much money, this much interest, this much change already, what the next one will be. So that hockey stick is going to be crazy. So I think five years from now, we won't, I don't think we could come up with some of the things that'll be five years from now. You know, I agree with that. That's how I see it. So I'm, I'm opti optimistic, hard saying that word to see what all that's gonna be. So it's gonna be fun. Excellent, I love that, love that. Thanks everyone. And so with that, uh, oh, wait, James, wait, I think wait, we're gonna wait, open wait. it up. What about oh. yourself? What are you up to? Oh, yeah, yeah. oh. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? Um, I have seen so much change in my 29 year career yeah. and my 30th anniversary of oh, that, wow. that it's kind of the same of what you guys all alluded to. I am extremely excited because I know I cannot predict in 10 years from now, how different it's going to be. And I just think back to my George Jetsons on my slide and, um, and what it might be like. And I always tease my kids about um, developing teleportation so that I <laughs> beam, me, beam me somewhere. Okay. And uh, cause they're all in engineering as well. Not too but, soon, um, not too soon. Yeah, not too soon though, no. Uh, <laughs> I don't think we have to worry about that. Right. So um, I'm just excited. I think there's a lot of really smart people in this world right now and um, bringing together that ecosystem because the world's you know, communication is allowing that. Is, I think that's why we're seeing so much acceleration and it's gonna go even faster. So I find that exciting. So thank you, Jan. <laughs> and with that, James, so um, I was gonna see if there was any more questions on the floor. Um, otherwise I hand over to you, I believe, right? 
I've tried to keep up on my Q and A from the list. So if there's any last question, please uh, please put it into the Q and A thing, and we can get it. Otherwise, James. Yeah. If if not, we can absolutely wrap. This has been fantastic. Thank you all for coming tonight, and thank our audience for participating and and being present for this. And lots of fun. I always like to learn new things than I have. So I it was a lot of fun. Thank you, Chris, and you were wonderful. Thank you for running that. It was great. Yeah, every, so everybody much. was really good. Thank you all. And uh, MIT Enterprise Forum wishes you guys a great night. Enjoy. Thank you. Right. Be well. Thanks, James. Bye, everyone.